<laughs> you throw something. <laughs> Cody Fern, uh, the hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> the uh, this season of uh, of Versace has really been a breakout uh, for you in many ways, um, and I, I just want to start by asking, you know, what has it been like to go through this? This, this journey and this kind of breakout success that you've had with this series? It's been wild. I mean, I'm just enjoying uh, the run that I'm having at the moment. It was just so much fun to work with such uh, intensely creative people. I mean, from Ryan to Darren to being on set with Edgar and seeing what Edgar and Ricky and Penelope do was, and then of course, you know, the amazing Judith Light. Um, <laughs> So it's just been fun to me to be working, to be honest. Um, everything else that's happening because of it, uh, there's been a bit of a spotlight and attention and that's always nice, but I kind of prefer to fly a little bit more under the radar and just keep my head down and do the work. So I'm avoiding as much as I can any of the hype. It's been difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and especially because uh, I believe you're, you're obviously Australian, but you also come from a very small remote uh town and here you are kind of uh now in the thick of this uh this journey um in in hollywood and coming up on award season um was there any preparation really for for this sort of thing i kind of feel like my entire life has been a preparation for this sort of thing i mean i think a part of what it has been is i've lived such different lives you know before i was an actor I worked in finance, I, you know, I, I did my, uh, I got my bachelor's in management and marketing at a university in Australia called Curtin University and then I kind of went off to work for Ernst & Young. Um, and so I had a completely different life and before that of course coming from the country is a completely other kettle of fish. Um, you know, I was living somewhere where you literally chop wood to keep warm in the winter. So it, it's, it's a very strange transition being in LA but um, but in terms of preparing for something like this I feel like what I have is an experience of uh, the other side of the hill so it, it kind of gives me well it not kind of it gives me a gratitude um, that I, I really want to keep you know I, I, I enjoy I'm just thrilled when I'm on set because I know what it's like to not be on set and I know what it's like to pursue something that you don't love. So being there, uh, it means that I'm fully invested each moment uh, and taking nothing for granted, which I think is the only preparation you can have because it's wild. Working with, with Ryan is, it's a whole other experience and the attention that has come to Crime Story is a whole other experience. So yeah. <laughs> um, so the character that you play, David Madsen, um, much was written about during the actual time of, uh, during when, when Cunanan's murders were happening. And um, there still is very little known. Um, what kind of research did you do to prepare to play him? A lot. Um, I think the, the first thing, strangely enough, that I went to was uh, Linda Kasabian's testimony in the Manson family trials. Uh, I, I remember reading about it, you know, several years ago and being struck by the psychology of someone who was essentially under the wrath of a, a, a serial killer and feeling like they're unable to break away and the psychology behind that. And so it was, it was really interesting to read her testimony just to see what it would be like for a person who is under that amount of duress and feels that they're engaging in something, they're complicit in something, but at the same time, you know, they're trying to get away. Uh, so I really looked into that. And of course, when, when you have Maureen's book, which is so well researched, I went straight to that. I'd read that before the audition. I kind of had the audition for uh, David and I read the book in the two weeks leading up to the audition. And then you jump into Tom Rubsmith's writing and you're safe. 
because you have these incredible structures and these incredible thinkers uh, and these great minds behind what's actually happening in a scene. So I felt very uh, safe to take risks. And then I think the, the next layer of it for me, besides researching just who David was and, and how David was, was getting to the essence of who David was uh, because mimicry is something, I mean, it's difficult in this situation because there's not many videos of David, but also mimicry is something that I didn't want to do in terms of honouring the life of David Madsen. It was something more that was about his essence um, and his level of compassion, which knew no bounds. So I... I guess I had to jump into, I, I, I'll call it the river, you know. It's like I, I had to just open up and dive deep because it's so dark. Um, and yet for David it comes from such a well of compassion and love. So these two, in contrast with one another, really propelled me somewhere emotionally. And so I just needed to learn to trust that. And then I was working with Dan Minahan, who's a phenomenal director, the best director I've ever worked with, and, and Gwyneth Hortapayden, who is just equally amazing. So I felt very able to go to places that I needed to go emotionally. <laughs> well, and and because of the nature of the series, which you know essentially starts with um, – the murder of Jeff Trail, and then kind of works backwards, uh, episode by episode. Did you actually start? How was the filming of it? Did you actually start with that stuff and then end with the lighter stuff, or what was the sequence like? Yeah, yeah, I, and I'm really grateful for that because what happened was, you know, it was I think it was a week into filming that it was a, a, about a week into filming that we filmed the death of Jeff Trail in David's apartment. So we were thrown into a situation whereby the most intense experience in a person's life is happening right now. And it really helped because, you know, De it was funny, the director, the, the, the way that the schedule had set up was that we were dealing with the, the death of Jeff Trail, but we were filming the opposite way and no reaction shots or whatnot because we needed to, there's a whole bunch of coverage that we needed to get of that particular thing. And on the day, Dan said, okay, we're turning around, Cody, and we're getting you. And myself, Darren, and Finn were all like, wait, what? You know, and they were like, oh, this is a hard one, buddy. Like, you know, good luck. And I hadn't really had the the time to prepare for it, to give myself the the structure and Dan was so good about directing that scene because he said, this person has no time to process what's happening right now. It's happening. He's in the thick of it and he's trying to work it out as he goes. And, and we're going to go for it. If we don't get it, we'll come back tomorrow and we'll, you know, we'll come back next week. It doesn't matter. Just give it a shot. And it's the first take that we used. I think we only did, it was, yeah, it was two takes. Uh, and I think working that way from the most intense moment in David's life backwards it was a joy for me because the concept of a personality goes out the window when something like this happens. So whoever you think the person is, they're now reacting to all new situations, to all new information, and it, it causes something fundamentally deep down to rise up and the, the struggle in David's mind begins, trying to understand what's happening, trying to understand how complicit he is, etc. And then working backwards, I suppose, forwards in some ways, <laughs> to the moment where David and Andrew fall in love was a real blessing for me playing David because I felt like I got to leave the audience and David with something light and special and, you know, I mean, it was... <laughs> was really sad, but it was it was nice to leave David with something positive rather than leaving him in this place of death and decay. So I and it's, enjoyed it. And, and it seems that, you know, one of the through lines of the series is not necessarily so much about Kunanen, but how homophobia played a role mm -hmm. in allowing these murders to happen. And uh, what I think is was was really interesting about about 
your David was how the internal homophobia really kind of seemed to work through that character um, in terms of him being uh, afraid of you know, not just his complicity, but what will his parents think? And then you realize that that has something to do with uh, that really great scene between uh, you and the father, um, the coming out scene. Um, wh what what was your approach in really taking David through this, particularly in that fourth episode of House by the Lake? First of all, I think the question for me, the fundamental question of David in this series is why doesn't he run? And it, that all comes to a head when he's in the bathroom and he smashes the window and he has the opportunity to go. And in the next moment we see him walk back to Andrew and, and sit down and face what is coming. Uh, and for me that was really at the core of how I was going to play David and what I was going to investigate with David because I think, and from talking to Ryan and everybody who worked on the show, uh, Tom, you know, who understands and is really able to write about gay shame in this very uh, precise, very clear, uh, very articulate way. It, was, it wasn't hard to jump into and it's a particularly insidious type of shame that I think does not come from within an individual, but from the constructs of a society. You know, shame doesn't, it's not something that has welled up within gay shame. It's something that is pushed into a person and then is internalized. And I think that's, in, especially in the nineties, coming out of the AIDS crisis uh, and, you know, looking forward into the 21st century it's hard to remember that this was it's not so long ago it's it's really not so long ago and so for david the the gay shame that i think that david is experiencing and feeling really comes to a head with when when jeff is murdered the question is asked David asks himself the question, how complicit am I in this murder? And not just because I was in the apartment, not just because I didn't defend Jeff, not just because I brought Jeff up, but because of who I am. How has my life story of who I am and of being gay impacted this moment? And has this always been coming? Do I deserve this? Is this something that I absolutely knew? Uh, Am I a killer? Do I deserve to live? Do we deserve to live? And I think he is processing all of these things in this trip with Andrew. And at the same time, he's reaching back because he understands that he's going to die. So he's going all the way back to his childhood, to moment in his childhood, to when he came out to his father and, and the response of his father, which is a beautiful response for somebody in the 90s. It's, it's in, incredibly prescient but at the same time if you read between the lines it, it does have an underlying there's an underlying uh sadness in the fact that a person has to fear telling their parents who they are and then offer it up for judgment you know do you accept this do you accept me do you accept who i am uh and that you're constantly at the whim of acceptance of other people. That first and foremost, you need, David needed his father to love him for who he was. And his father is able to say, I don't agree with this thing, but I still love you. Uh, so there's still that slight moment there where it's understood that this is something that needs to be talked about and processed and that people can have opinions on it about whether or not they like it or don't like it. And I can say, I love you, but I can say, I don't accept you. Um, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily the angle that David's father took. And especially in the series we deal with, like that's amazing for the time, but it's for the time, you know? And, uh, and so I think that's really how the series deals with gay shame with David is that it's asking all of these, these really subtle questions and, um, and asking why does he stay? And it ultimately comes down to gay shame. And for those who are incisive enough to see it, 
the episode is drenched in that. Each moment is is drenched in that. Even even the moment where David is asking at the very start, you know, he's he's really trying to be the very best architect that he can. And it's it's a level of ferocity in his career of ambition to be better than everybody else, to prove that he is a first-rate citizen, that he has something to offer, that he could absolutely do this and he deserves this opportunity, uh, which is something a lot of gay men feel, uh, and, and certainly in conversations with Tom and with Dan, about what it means, what ambition means in that period of time. So it manifests in different ways in the episode, and I think people will be able to pick up on different elements of it, especially those people who lived in that time. And, and, and that, that, that episode particularly, you're, you, you and Darren and Chris are so you know entwined together. What was that working relationship like, uh, especially knowing where it was going? <laughs> Darren is amazing. Uh, Darren is an incredible actor. He's one of the most generous human beings you'll ever meet. And he's a lot of fun. And Darren on set was incredibly light and nimble and flexible and open. And it's disarming because uh, he's able to switch from Darren Chris being on set to Andrew Cunanan in a flash. And it's, it's frightening. And I think Andrew really needed that energy and thank God Darren brought that because it lightened the atmosphere on set. You know, when you're shooting something that's this heavy and every episode is heavy, you can't always be you know, earphones in, miserable, gloomy, etc. especially when you're working backwards and uh, Andrew and, and David have this beautiful relationship. So Darren and I really got Darren and I really got along. I mean, he's a, he's an incredible guy and a great friend, and the chemistry was just there with us. We would just and Finn, you know, the three of us were just like from day one. We were hysterically laughing, and it was to the point where before takes, we'd be like, okay, we've got to we've got to cut this out, and we've got to get ready, and we've got to prepare, and not in a disrespectful way, but just in the way of we really enjoyed each other's company, and that I think has found its way into the three amigos in the series. You know, you can see that they really have loved each other, have had love for each other and have enjoyed each other's company. And I think that was also crucial uh, to telling this story. So we're coming up on um, the Emmy season and, um, uh, it, it, and we are an awards website. Uh, have you given any thought to if you were nominated uh, <laughs> what episode you would you would submit? Oh gosh, uh, I I have no uh, control or say over those things. It's all up to the powers that be. I will say, I'm just thrilled to be running with this group of people. When you're working, the the, the category this year, I think, is going to be because I believe it would be like supporting actor in a limited series. Correct. It's, Fierce competition. And you've got incredible people in this series. You've got uh, Edgar and Ricky and Max Greenfield and Finn Whitrock and Mike Farrell. My God, Mike Farrell. Um, I, I think that the whole series is a tour de force of acting. So I'm just excited to see what happens and I'm thrilled for everybody in the series. It would be nice, <laughs> but you know, I, this is this is really my first major job in the U.S. Uh, I'd only been in one uh, indie film before this, so I'm just happy to be a part of the conversation. I'm happy that we're having this conversation. <laughs> I'm already a winner. <laughs> and um, I know you probably can't say a whole lot uh, about your next big project, which is the final season of House of Cards. Yeah. Um, but how? Have you started filming that? Um, uh, and and what can you just say about being a part of that? <laughs> you know, I'm really not allowed to say anything. It's it's so heavily under lock and key um, that we're we're really all just putting our heads down and focusing on the work. We have started filming. Uh, we've been filming for a while now. 
I'll just say that I'm so I've I've watched House of Cards since day one, and it's always been thrilling. You know, you tune in and it's just it's the same with in a funny way. I I said to my agents a long time ago, you know, uh, I really want to work in film, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if I get to work in TV, I really want to work with Ryan Murphy or in House of Cards. And it's funny, we all laugh about it because the two things that I said I happen to be working on and I never in a million years could have dreamed these things possible. So I'm just grateful to be on the set and I'm grateful to see what Robin is doing. Uh, I think that she is a powerhouse. I, she's a phenomenal actress and I've followed her since Hurley Burley so long ago. Um, so I'm just glad to, to, to be in in the world of Claire Underwood. And that's all I can really say. I can't tell you anything <laughs> else. Oh, well, we certainly look forward to, say, to, to seeing what that brings. And congratulations on everything. And, and thanks so much for uh, talking to me. Appreciate no it. Thank you.